We're returning back to our discipleship course, all right? So if you open up Frederick Widowson's book, all right? It's a Bible Believer's Guide to World History at page 265. 265. We're going to cover a lot of exciting stuff. Uh, apparently, South America has a very, very interesting history. And we're going to cover uh, some things of what the explorer saw. What did they exactly see? And then we're going to go back to this, these mysterious lands in South America where you might recall I told you there were some sons of God activity possibly going on that time. And then as centuries passed by, the inhabitants just carried on the culture and tradition, what they learned from the Nephilim or the sons of God. And then the explorers, they heard so many myths and legends about these so-called magical places. And then what did they exactly see? So we're going to cover one of these, uh, I guess you can say tribes or groups of people one at a time. So let's start off with page 265 at Frederick Widowson's book. And we're going to start off uh, the slave trade, okay? The exploration and conquest. So we're coming over here about the explorations, further things that they saw. And what did they exactly discover? The slave trade went hand in hand with the lust for gold which the Spanish enjoyed in the Americas and the thirst for exploration and conquest everywhere. The Portuguese fleet appeared at Calicut on the Indian Ocean in 1500 after Vasco da Gama had rounded the Cape of Good Hope in 1498. Between 1500 and 1505, the Portuguese established trading posts along the west coast of India. Francisco de Almeida was appointed first viceroy of Portuguese India in 1505, also establishing bases along the east coast of Africa. His son Lorenzo established a base at Ceylon, now called Sri Lanka. Alfonso de Albuquerque was appointed viceroy of India in 1507. In 1508, Sultan Mahmud Begarha of Gujarat allied with Kansu Algari of Egypt to try to halt the Portuguese interference with what had been a Muslim monopoly and fought the naval battle of Dabul against them, resulting in Lorenzo being killed. His father gained revenge in 1509 by burning a number of Muslim ports along India's coast, including Goa and Dabul. Almeida destroyed the Muslim fleet at the Battle of Diu in 1509. The Portuguese not only built valuable trading posts on the east coast of Africa and the west coast of India, but they moved on to Canton, China in 1514, Burma by 1519, and Portuguese were in Peking, China by 1520, but were expelled from the capital due to some misbehavior by their ships on the coast of China. Okay, so this whole entire paragraph is talking about, again, we've seen the exploration of the Portuguese and the Spanish. And where they started out was in port regions of Africa and India. And then you notice that these Europeans, they were conquering terrain one by one, more and more. So then the Muslims, which had a monopoly, as you've heard Widowson, uh, mentioned in his book, they've been, they're being conquered one by one, whereas the Catholics are taking over the territories more and more. From there, they were interested in trade with China as well, but then it reaches out to the Americas. Now, when you combine these territories, remember, the reason why the Catholics became so powerful is because of two countries, Spain and Portugal. Now, when you combine these two with all their explorations that they made in these vast lands, how much more powerful is their empire now? So their empire is pretty much, you could say, worldwide. It's worldwide effect and domination. So that's why the Catholic empire became extremely powerful, and no one could topple it, it seemed like, and the, until the Lord had other plans for the Catholic empire later on. And then the Christians were actually the one, the Bible-believing fold were the later ones uh, in later times that became the most powerful and the Lord blessed it because of how they honored the King James Bible. 
but we're going to come to that a little later. Right now we're covering the time of uh, between Sardis and Philadelphia. So let's cover those church age timelines first. Let's continue on with the explorations. Now we come to the Americas, all right? We see how they conquer terrain one by one, and then now they're coming to the Americas. Let's read here. In the meanwhile, the Spanish were conquering all of South and Central America and much of North America with the explorer Coronado. In 1540 to 1542, conquering New Mexico while he looked for fabled seven cities of gold and is the first European to see the Grand Canyon. So this is Coronado right here. We've, this, we've talked about Almeida with his uh, terrain over this side. Coronado concerning the Americas. He was on the search for certain myths and legends that he heard about. And these myths and legends were formed, as we discussed in Genesis studies, uh, excuse me, in the beginning of this intermediate discipleship course when we covered the Genesis timeline, myths legends are formed because it start out with something true. It start out with something true, and then it exaggerates and turns into myths and legends. So there might be an element of truth with what Coronado was trying to find. Why? Because I pointed out to you, where did the sons of God retreat to? Which is very interesting that you've studied in the discipleship classes. Don't forget the, uh, I think the city, if I recall, Teotihuacan, and also the Mayans. Remember about those two civilizations where the, it seemed like a lot of mysterious activity. Same thing like the Egyptians, how they built the pyramids. Uh, but now we're going to cover the group of people who start to take over after, uh, in latter centuries, when we pass the epitome of the Mayan civilization and Teotihuacan, if I uh, remember the cities correctly or the cultures correctly. But let's continue on with the explorers. St. Augustine, Florida was founded by the Spanish in 1565 after they massacred a French colony on the St. John's River. Present-day California, New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas would also belong to Spain. See, that's a huge swath of land. So the Catholic Empire is very, is getting extremely powerful. This is the time that Francis, uh, so we'll skip him. We'll go down to, let's see over here. So much wealth and riches. All right, so we, I've skipped a couple sentences. So much wealth and riches were being removed from the new world, from the Americas, to Spain that the English sea dog Captain Francis Drake and his ship, the Golden Hind, snared more than 10 Tons of gold from captured Spanish ships in just two years, from 1577 to 1579. So the Americas had that much wealth and gold. Spain spent their fabulous wealth as soon as they got it. That's why the Catholic Empire became powerful. Here are some examples how Catholic Spain became so powerful. For instance, Peter Bernstein's The Power of Gold tells us that Charles V in 1516 became Holy Roman Emperor by being voted in by the Pope's German electors at a cost to Spain of 850,000 florins, a huge fortune. It kind of sounds like our election process. Uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm diverting. And further bankrupted Spain by 27 years of constant warfare with Francis I of France, plus trying to claim the Netherlands as the property of Spain. Conquest can be quite expensive. So that's where they all got it. They stole it from all their explorations. What helped it was, remember, the slave trade. So remember this. You've got to remember the patterns here on how they became extremely powerful, these two countries. You, as long as you have the slaves, then you get people working for you. And then when you conquer more lands, you just fill it out with slaves. And then what happens? Then you get their rich natural resources that nobody claims. And then you become very powerful. You become very powerful. That's how you build a church. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, you're seeing a pattern here that I'm revealing on how empires rise and fall, actually. Uh, there are two branches that I think is extremely interesting, and that's history and psychology. If you major in these two things, you might become a very powerful, successful person, actually. Uh, so it is intensely interesting when you study both history and psychology together. But it can become a very demonic thing if you don't study the Word of God. 
When you have that word of God, it keeps you in the balance. Because why? What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. And God already knows human nature long ago before the psychologist. All right, well, anyway, I just dropped some, some things, just some tips over there. All right. Now, here's something very interesting. This one is a Reuters news agency story about the name America. Now, the name America is supposed to be from Vespucci. So from Vespucci, we're supposed to get the name America, but here are some interesting things about the conflict behind the name of America and how it was founded. So it may not be as what you normally hear in history textbooks. So let me give you the reading here. Page 266, and this is from the Reuters News Agency story. It's called, Map That Named America is a Puzzle for Researchers. Let me read. The only surviving copy of the 500-year-old map that first used the name America. Okay, so that's where we get the first mention, how historians can dig it up. It's from a 500-year-old map. Goes on permanent display this month at the Library of Congress, but even as it prepares for its debut, the 1507 Walt C. Mueller map remains a puzzle for researchers. Why did the map maker name the territory America and then change his mind later? How was he able to draw South America so accurately? Why did he put a huge ocean west of America years before European explorers discovered the Pacific? Hmm. So then there's something going on with this Walt C. Mueller map. That's where we get the name the first mention of America. In this Wall C. Mueller map, there's some things going on that they were wondering why there, were, there was such accurate depiction and also uh, if there were changes. So let me keep reading. I'm going to skip down to the paragraph that starts out with the map was created, okay? The map was created by the German monk Martin Waldsee Mueller. Thirteen years after Christopher Columbus first landed in the Western Hemisphere, the Duke of Lorraine brought Waldsee Mueller and a group of scholars together at a monastery and Saint died in France to create a new map of the world. The result, published two years later, is stunningly accurate and surprisingly modern. So this is amazing when they, didn't, uh, when they didn't discover much of America's territory even. And here are some answers to some of these questions probably to why they were able to figure it out. Herbert said, the actual shape of South America is correct. The width of South America at certain key points is correct within 70 miles of accuracy. That's pretty impressive. Given what Europeans are believed to have known about the world at the time, it should not have been possible for the map makers to produce it, he said. So how they do it? The map gives a reasonably correct depiction of the west coast of South America. But according to history, Vasco Nunes de Balboa did not reach the Pacific by land until 1513. And Ferdinand Magellan did not round the southern tip of the continent until 1520. So this is a rather compelling map to say, how did they come to that conclusion, Herbert said. The map makers say they based it, so this is a clue, they based it on what? The 1,300-year-old works of, go back to Egypt. Isn't that interesting? Because remember, the Egyptians, they were pretty accurate with the alignment of the stars, with the pyramids and stuff like that. And then Bible believers have taught you that it's because of Nephilim or sons of God activity there. So they were basing it on the wisdom of perhaps demonic offspring then to explore the lands. But 1,300-year-old uh, works of the Egyptian geographer Ptolemy, as well as letters Florentine navigator Amerigo Vespucci wrote describing his voyages to the New World. But Herbert said there must have been something more but he's not quite sure. From the writings of Vespucci, you couldn't have prepared the map, Herbert said. There had to be something cartographic with it. So then the scientists, they try to find natural explanations to it. But obviously for our end, we know that uh, 
if there are some mysteries behind it, uh, it wouldn't be too far-fetched to say that what about the wisdom of the demonic offspring that carried on through Noah's timeline, and they had a lot of wisdom about the world that time, and they just passed it on to their ancestors. But no, 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 scientists can't go that far. Why? Because we must have been much smarter today compared to those primitive people back then. So that's why they have a hard time swallowing it. So they keep trying to find natural explanations to it. Walsey Mueller made it clear he was naming the new land after Vespucci, describing how he came up with the name America based on the navigator's first name. But he soon had misgivings about what he had done. Why? What's going on here? An atlas Walsey Mueller produced six years later shows only part of the east coast of the Americas and refers to it as terra incognita, unknown land. Huh? Well, what's going on here? There might have been political powers at play. We skip down to the paragraph where it says he speculated, okay? He speculated that power politics played a role. Spain and Portugal divided the globe between them in 1494, two years after Columbus with territory to the east going to Portugal and land to the west to Spain. That demarcation line is oddly absent from the 1507 Wald C. Mueller map. And flags marking territorial claims in South America suggest Portugal controls the region's southernmost land, even though it is in Spain's area of influence. On the latest map, uh, on the later map, the southernmost flag is Spanish, Herbert said. It is possible one could say that the 1507 map is influenced strongly by the Portuguese sources and conceivably the 1516 map may be influenced more by Spanish sources, he said. So that might be the explanation. I just want to make sure that the archive video did catch the audio on the recording. Oh, okay then, but the archive uh, caught everything, yeah, right? Okay, that's fine. See if you can keep trying to fix it, all right? Uh, contact uh, our tech guys, all right? Contact them, okay? All right then, so let's go back here. And onliners, obviously you don't want the message to be disrupted, so please pray for the tech, all right? Please pray for the tech, all right? Don't be so hard and critical toward our tech team because once you get in here, you realize it. Plus, we keep going, as you notice, to all kinds of different places, okay? All right, so let's see here. We skip down now to uh, the paragraph where it says in, in 1513 Ponce de Leon, all right? So we're da now over there. So you've heard about the interesting uh, debate about America's origin, its name and how politics played into it, and why the map may be so accurate. So it might be what I think is it's knowledge from antediluvian people from Noah's days. And it could be just the knowledge that they had that carried from the sons of God, which is not too far-fetched, because every culture and civilization has survived and continued through just word of mouth from their previous generations. That's inevitable in history. All right. Let's go down to here. In 1530, Ponce de Leon explores Florida. Vasco Nunes de Balboa travels through Panama in 1513 and becomes the first European to see the Pacific Ocean from the Americas. In 1517, Francisco uh, Fernandez de Card Cordoba explores the Mayan ruins of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Skip down. In 1519, Ferdinand Magellan, a Portuguese working for Spain, leaves on an attempt to circumnavigate the globe. He dies fighting the natives in 1521 in what was later to be called the Philippines. In 1524, Italian navigator Giovanni da Verrazzano, working for France, enters what we now call New York Harbor. In 1541, Hernando de Soto leads the first Europeans to see the Mississippi River. In 1607, Luis Valles de Torres sails around New Guinea. All right, so you see all these big shot names on the explorations that they make. So basically, the cat is out of the bag. Once, uh, one territory to another new territory in America. So now they're conquering lands. They're claiming lands for themselves. That's how the Spanish 
Portuguese Empire, the Catholic Empire, became extremely powerful. All right, so now that you've heard the stories of the exploration, let's go deep now, okay? Let's go a little bit more specific. So let's go more specifically to what they actually uh, discovered, the details, not just a generalized idea of so-and-so discovered so-and-so. Now let's go a little bit deep, more specific, with some of the explorers, what they exactly saw and what they found. And now they're coming across territory of interesting people where myths and legends were formed. Let's go to page 185. 185. Now let's discuss the famous Inca Empire. I believe to my knowledge it's around uh, Peru and Chile, some, somewhere around there. But the Inca Empire, when the, when the Catholics came across their territory and were conquering some parts of their lands and made exploration, it is very fascinating what they saw in the Inca Empire. But uh, we failed to mention about, uh, don't forget those Mayans, and then the other group of people, which is intensely interesting, I'll cover later on. But let's first cover the Incas here, okay? So let's start off with their story. All right, I'm going to butcher a lot of names. Here we go. All right, page 185, the Inca Empire. Pachacuti's brother, Kapok Yupanqui, led the Inca army in 1450 to besiege the city-state of KJ Mar uh, Cajamarca in the foothills east of Chimor. Cajamarca's leader was allied with Minchacaman, who then came to his aid. So then Pachacuti, he's a very uh, important name, uh, basically one of the original people where the Inca empire started to form. All right, His brother, Kapok Yupanqui, has been, uh, has been conquering lands for Pachacuti and helping him out. And basically, Yupanqui, he was fighting against Minchakaman. And what happened is this. After an ambush set by Yupanqui, Minchakaman was forced to retreat from KJ Marka. Yupanqui was so successful that his brother, Pachacuti, was afraid he might want the throne. So... They were uh, conquering tribes, and then just like we've studied in history, uh, little tribes uh, conquer more tribes, and then you become an empire a little bit more, right? So that's what was going on. The Incas were growing through Pachacuti's brother conquering lands. So now that they're conquering some tribes here and groups here, Pachacuti's been afraid of his brother. So like a good brother, what did he do? What, like a good brother, he executed him on his return home at the head of his victorious army to Cusco, their capital. All right, so Cusco, all right, or Cusco, all right, or Costco, I don't know. All right, so, <laughs> all right, so uh, Cusco is their capital, all right? That's the starting capital for the Inca Empire. Now let's see the power grow. Ten years later, according to Spanish chronicles, Pachacuti sent out another army under his own son, the person he had designated as his successor, Thupa Inca Yupanqui. All right, so uh, now it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a same last name, Yupanqui, but it's not k -Pak this time. It's Thupa Inca. So Thupa Inca, his son, became the, became the guy that's been uh, helping out his dad in conquering territories. The Incas were now taken very seriously because they're growing in power slowly. By threatening its water supply, the Inca paralyzed Chimor's defenses and took Minchakaman back to Cus uh, Cusco along with his artisans, determined to make their capital greater than Chan Chan. When the Spanish conqueror Pizarro held his victory celebration in Cusco 17 years later, it was a city more opulent and beautiful than anything he had ever seen in Europe. Pachacuti's successful 25-year effort to build an empire was done often in a surprisingly peaceful manner with foreign aid and an ever-growing influence in the soon-to-be-conquered cities and regions until there was no question of Inca primacy. primacy. He spent a great deal of his time building his lavish capital to reflect his own glory as emperors often do. Okay, so uh, when Pizarro came 
to conquer the Incas. We'll come to him much later on. Uh, Pachacuti, he was growing his empire. And what you'll notice right here, it was more like a socialist, authoritarian, or more... Uh, it was kind of like China back then, you might recall, right? The pe basically, the people were dependent on their government. That's my bottom line. The people were dependent on their government. And then that's how the empire became very powerful and prosperous, which is why a lot of people, they get deceived by that, thinking that this is good for us. We need to have more government control. That way we can have a prosperous society. But as you studied in history, uh, the, the weakness toward that is unexpected situations happen. And when unexpect, unexpected, unprecedented situations happen, then how do the people survive when they become dependent on their government? Look at, uh, look at us right now, right? Fine job on what we're all doing right now. So uh, the reason why America became prosperous at the beginning was because of the independent mindset. That's the reason why uh, when we come to state, versus, uh, state and federal, when we come to the later days of the Civil War, that's the uh, beginning of the downfall of America, is when uh, the federal government start to take more control. And autonomous local power, independent power, became crushed. That's why Bible believers, we don't fall for this federal thing. We don't follow one organization like a pope. Amen. We don't follow like the Southern Baptist Convention. We're autonomous, we're local, and we're independent. And that's how we're able to survive, and its people survive. That's extremely important to understand. All right, so I dropped some gold mines there, all right? Let's get back to history, all right? You can learn a lot from history. You notice that, right? You learn a lot from history. Okay, let's cover the interesting parts about the Inca Empire. Otherwise, I'll never finish. All right, at the heart of Cusco was the plaza of Alquepata. All right, so let's describe some of their architecture here, their buildings. Just like, uh, if I recall, Teotihuacan. It's kind of similar to a lot of its splendor. 625 feet by 550 feet carpeted with white sand carried in from the Pacific and raked daily by the city's army of workers. Large villas and temples surrounded the square on three sides, their walls made from immense blocks of stone, cut so precisely and fit so tight that Pizarro's younger cousin, Pedro, reported that a pin could not be inserted into the joints. Across the front of the buildings were enormous plates of polished gold. It's filled with gold. That's why Spain was, very, was able to carry tons of gold with them. When the sun filled the plaza with its white sand and its sheet, sheets of gold, it was filled with light and quite impressive. The plaza was the center of the empire, and to the Inca, the center of the universe. The network of spiritually powerful lines called... I'm going to mispronounce this, Zeke, that linked holy sites such as tombs, shrines, and other landmarks called Waka, was so complex and difficult to understand that the Inca had, according to the Spanish, a thousand men whose job it was just to remember what went to what. So one big white stone outside of the city was believed to be the petrified body of one of the original Inca brothers who founded the culture and was often carried with the armies dressed in fine clothes as the sort of talisman. So notice it's so pagan here. This is an extremely pagan, if not demonic, culture with what they did. It's so amazing that uh, with their uh, lines, their buildings that would link toward each other, that's so complex and difficult to understand that the Spanish reported a thousand men, they had the job to remember everything. It's, it's amazing. By 1491, the Inca ruled the largest empire on the earth. So, it's, uh, you got to realize this, the Inca empire was greater than the Ming dynasty China, Ivan the Great's Russia, and the Songhai empire in Africa, Zimbabwe, even the Ottoman Empire that took over the Byzantium Empire, remember the Ottoman Turks, bigger than that one, or any European state at the time. You've got to realize the Inca Empire was larger than all of them. That's impressive. 
No wonder Spain became powerful when they capitalized on, that, on their power, right? On their resources. That's why Catholic Spain became extremely powerful. All right, let's continue on. Um, the empire encompassed every conceivable type of terrain, from the rainforest of the Amazon to the deserts of the Peruvian coast to the snow-capped heights of the Andes Mountains. They covered a lot of terrain. They, they attempted to unite a large group of different people with different languages and religion into one entity, speaking only Runa Sumi, the Inca language. They practiced, so you can see a great type of the Antichrist right here. They practiced an, an Assyrian type of removal. So they practiced the culture of Assyria. Type of removal where entire populations were transported to foreign areas and forced to work on government projects, moving them around the largest system of roads on the planet. To organize this vast empire, they developed a unique system of writing. This is impressive. They made a unique system of writing based on a series of knots on string that formed a binary code similar to today's computer languages. <laughs> it's extremely impressive. The Inca homeland is not only high, but very steep, with slopes of more than 65 degrees in many places. It is amazing that so many people lived in such vulnerable circumstances. By combining foods and products from many different environments through exchange between the many varied people in the empire, the Incas managed to live a better life than any one ethnic group could have maintained on their own. But you know what's interesting? this glorious, powerful empire. It grew fast and was short-lived, short li lasting less than 100 years. That's, I mean, it only lasted less than 100 years. It was short-lived. As early as 1350, they were a relatively unimportant people, but this is, uh, so then how did they become so powerful and important then, if they were so unimportant back then? So this is how it was formed, the, uh, the origins of it, okay? Legend has it told by Spanish chroniclers that a family of four brothers and four sisters left the region around Lake Titicaca for some unknown reasons and wandered until they arrived at the site of their future capital of Cusco. Hmm, remember? That's the capital and the beginning of everything. So then four brothers, four sisters just happened to travel over here and then what happened? Archaeologists claim that this migration began around 1200. So 1200, okay? This is the birth of where the Inca Empire was starting to grow and form. They slowly became more powerful until a confrontation with another group, the Chanca, in 1438 led to a war that was won by a leader who refused to run, Inca Cusi Yupanqui who captured many Chanca leaders and skinned them alive in victory celebration. This Inca Yupanqui, after winning a dispute against his father, declared himself, guess who? Pachacuti, right there. All right, so then we see about uh, 100, 200 years later, this is the guy that started to build its muscle and civilization of the In Inca Empire. So what did Pachacuti did? that became so powerful. He stated that all Inca emperors were descended from the sun. He then went about conquering everything he saw. Kind of like Egypt, right? I'm the son of the sun god, etc. That demonic mindset, where do they carry all these ideas from, right? Maybe this, like I told you, perhaps those sons of God, when they went from Egypt to Canaan and then from Phoenicia, they hit the British Isles and then could have went all the way to the Americas, I told you. That's how uh, the migration could have went. But anyway, I digress. Let's read. The Inca homeland was called Tawantinsuyu, or the land of the four quarters. It was a socialist state where every citizen owed the government forced labor and where everything belonged to the government, especially to the Inca emperor personally. The state fed and clothed all work gangs as they built dams, terraces, and irrigation canals, grew crops on state lands, <coughs> raised herds on state pastures, and made pottery in state factories. 
They paved highways and supplied the runners and lamas, carrying messages and goods that ran along them. The Inca emperor was treated as a god. He was carried on a golden litter as he did not walk in public. Did you hear that? <laughs> People left the roads when he passed, climbing the hillsides, worshiping and adoring him. One of the expressions of adoration was to pull out their eyelashes and eyebrows, according to one Spanish chronicler named Gamboa. Man, this guy was treated like he was something else. His servants collected and... Listen to this. This is so ridiculous. His servants collected and stored every item he touched, body waste included, to make sure that no lesser human being touched them and profaned their sacredness. The ground was not good enough to receive the Inca emperor's saliva, so he spat in the hand of a special servant who wiped it on a special cloth and stored it for safekeeping. Some of you guys get, better start doing that when I preach and I spit at you when I preach. Some of you got to get those special cloths and store it, man. <laughs> maybe this guy, right? Maybe, maybe this guy that we wiped the whiteboard with. <laughs> All right, the tears of our pastor. <laughs> yes. All right, let's keep reading here. Um, once a year, everything touched by the Inca lead leader included his bedding, clothing, garbage, and saliva was burned in a ceremony. Man, he was treated like something else. Thupa Inca, the 10th Inca emperor. Okay, so now we come to him, all right? So Pachacuti laid out some, and his uh, ancestry of people later after him, they had quite a uh, deluded, fantastical mindset. But now we come to Thupa Inca, the 10th Inca emperor, okay? This is where we get down to a little bit more. Started the practice of the emperor marrying his sister in order to maintain the purity of the royal line. Where did he get that idea from? You go all the way back to Egypt again. Isn't it very strange? A lot of the patterns of Egypt is carried on over here by pagan satanic cultures. Do they, worship, do they all worship the same father, I wonder? The Inca sister wife would accompany him on military expeditions with up to a thousand concubines or subordinate wives. This didn't seem to slow him down as by 1493, Tupa Inca had sent armies deep into current day Ecuador and Chile, uh, doubling the empire. With so many potential heirs around and the many offspring produced, it was common for the person who would succeed the emperor to start killing his brothers and then picking his sister to marry. And that's a nightmare, man. I don't want to be born into that kind of family. That is quite a nightmare. The 11th Inca, Huayna Capac, was an organizer rather than a conqueror. All right, so we come to Huayna Capac now, all right? So he was a man who organized things rather than conquering. So he built up the structure of the empire by organizing everything. So he's the next emperor. He focused on government works projects, even, this is ridiculous, even making a work crew move a small mountain just to keep them busy. <laughs> Spanish conquistadors reported several roads leading from the same small towns, each one built by a different Inca emperor. Much information we have about the Inca comes from Spanish sources who interviewed the vanquished in great detail to understand their history. In 1615, the writer Felipe Guaman Poma de Ayala presented a massive history of the Incas with over 400 drawings to the king of Spain. That's interesting. It is now a fundamental source of information on the empire. Uncharacteristically, Huayna Capac went on an expedition to southern Ecuador where he was born on one of his father's military expeditions. And he liked it so much he had a great palace built at a city not now called Cuenca and sent Atahualpa, all right, so that's one of his, that's his general, okay? On to conquer a few more provinces with his generals. This expedition was beaten badly, 
And even when Wena himself returned to lead his armies, he was humiliated in defeat by jungle people who refused to be subdued. He finally died in his Ecuadorian palace. A bloody succession battle followed. And it seems that on his deathbed, he passed over Atahualpa, who had not impressed him in battle. So he was not impressed with his general. So he would not give the kingdom to him. And chose another son. But guess what? His other son died of the same illness. So his son died of the same illness as him, but the son died before him. <laughs> so uh, Kapok, he had to, Kapok or Kapok, whatever, he had to think of a different son now. So this is a really messed up, uh, this is a really messed up lineage trying to find a successor. He then picked another son whom the priest said was not favored by the gods. But when they tried to report this to Wena, they found that he had already died. So it's too late. So then they have to choose the other son then. So what happened? The court noble settled on the 19-year-old boy, the son that he chose, whom the priest had rejected. Atahualpa stayed in Ecuador, supposedly because he knew his life expectancy would be short if he went back to the capital. Okay, so he didn't want to go back to the capital. He stayed at Ecuador. Remember, they were all the way up at Ecuador. Why? Because Wayna Kapak, he wanted to conquer more lands over there. He had a fantastical mindset. He wanted to conquer that territory. So at the Walpa, he stayed up toward Ecuador. He didn't go down to the capital of the Incas. And then here comes the sun now. Wayna Kapak's mummified body was dressed in fine clothing and taken back to Cusco, Okay, so remember that's their capital. On a gold litter covered with feathers, of course. Remember, don't forget that golden litter. <laughs> Noblemen plotted to kill the new boy, emperor, and install someone else on the throne. Realizing his danger, with Atahualpa having stayed behind in Ecuador with the majority of the Inca army, the 19-year-old emperor, Washkar, all right? That's where it goes now. Washkar is the son. So what did he do? He executed the nobles. Since Wena Kapok had not married Washkar's mother, <laughs> this is so messed up, it was commanded, <laughs> very disturbing, it was commanded that she, the mother, marry the mummy in an elaborate ceremony in order to make his succession legitimate. He then married his sister, over the objections of his mother, who did not seem to have too much of a problem marrying her dead brother. <laughs> this, this is pure pagan culture. You can see that there. Pagan lifestyle, pagan thinking. That's what happens with society without God. You notice that? Civil war immediately followed that seesawed over the Andes Mountains for three years. Initially, the advantage went to Washkar who even went to Ecuador, so he went up to Ecuador, and then what? He captured Atahualpa, so he got him now. He nearly lost one of his ears as it was almost torn off in his capture. In stockade, Atahualpa had one of his wives smuggle him in a weapon by which he dug his way out, so he escaped. Atahualpa escaped, even though Washkar conquered him and captured him. Why? How did he escape? It seems that his guards had gotten drunk and allowed a conjugal visit to take place during which the wife's sister snuck in the tools necessary for escape. He reassembled his army and on a plateau near today's Peru-Ecuadoran -Ecuador border, the forces led by Atahualpa destroyed Washkar's army. Ten years later, the Spanish chronicler Cieza de Leon personally saw the battlefield and estimated the number of the fallen by the remains of the unburied dead to be about 16,000. Washkar's main general was captured and beheaded, so Washkar lost. I mean, Washkar could have won if those stupid guards, they didn't let Atahualpa escape. But now Atahualpa won. Atahualpa, what did he do with Washkar's main general? He actually beheaded him. A bowl was mounted to that general's skull and a spout between his teeth and Atahualpa used it as a cup to drink intoxicating chicha. How about that? Man, that's a messed up culture that time. Scary culture that time. That's why Pizarro, 
later on in his men, they almost wet their pants, so to speak. So you're going to find that out later on. They were a scary group of people, the Incas. Washkar and Atahualpa met in a huge battle at the head of their armies in a final battle that De Leon estimated cost the lives of 35,000 soldiers. Washkar was captured in an ambush and was taken captive in Cusco, where he was forced to watch his wives, children, and relatives loyal to him killed in front of his eyes. And then what happened? While Washkar lost everybody precious to him and became the prisoner, in October or November of 1532, the victors learned that a pale, hairy people who sat on enormous animals had landed on the coast. Atahualpa, curious, was content to wait for the new visitors to come to him. Pizarro, with only 168 Spanish soldiers. How in the world did Spain conquer the Inca Empire through that? Next time in our discipleship class, all right? So we'll cover in our next discipleship class. And let's not forget the explorers, when they conquered more lands, they saw more things. Don't forget the Mayan civilization, it's becoming more extinct now, but they're a significant culture. And then back to Teotihuacan, if I got the name of that city right, the people left, the culture died out. That was the height and the epitome, if you remember in our intermediate discipleship class, of Mayan civilization and other people in South and Central America trading off. Teotihuacan was a very important uh, city and powerful, I guess, empire, you can say, at that time. The people took this, the other people who took it over were these people. And they found the ruins of the sons of God, so to speak. And they decided to take it over and continue on their practice and culture. Let's cover next discipleship class. Uh, my Father, I pray that tonight's teachings were a blessing to the hearers and that we understood a lot about mankind's nature and that we don't repeat their patterns, that we can improve upon the mistakes that we have learned as Bible-believing Christians and not through a secular mindset, and that the Bible-believing Christians will be able to live lives that will better please you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.